What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Fireside with Fathers. Happy feast day of uh, the conversion of St. Paul. It's uh, something that I just put together 20 minutes ago. We just came out of Mass, and it hit me that uh, today is... Well, I knew it was the conversion of St. Paul, but um, it hit me that we're going to have a guest on today who has a very powerful conversion as well. So it's all it's all providential. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's the only feast day that we have in the church that celebrates a saint's conversion i could be wrong but i don't don't i can't think of any other saint that we we stop and we actually celebrate the moment of his conversion in the case of saint paul it was absolutely radical his uh his turning from going one direction and going into another one completely 180 degree turn until he he basically wrote that it was not him living his life anymore but christ living his life in him and you could just see it in his words and his actions and basically everything he was just emanating jesus christ which is at the end of the day this is what we're doing this like it's all to get people in contact with the living god made man jesus christ so that he can come into your life and completely transform it so we have damien richardson on today so for a lot of the um the irish listeners you guys would be a bit familiar with him i think um and for the non-Irish listeners, a disclaimer on the very thick Dublin accent. You guys, just like like I said last week with Father Kevin's Manchester accent, put the subtitles on if you have to. Um, it does somewhat of a good job, but uh, no, nah, he should be okay. It's not, it's not that not that hard to understand, but um, it also gives it gives it character because it's not every day you get a you get a, that thick of a dub accent um, in your life. But um, it's an it's actually a very powerful story. Um, there's a lot of elements in it that I think we could even just take out and have a whole program on that. Um, people he's met, places like Chinaclo as well, where he's been, uh, those would deserve in themselves their own episode and the work that he's doing afterwards as well. So we've hopefully got Damien uh, tonight and hopefully as well we can get him gone willing on other, other episodes, maybe like a monthly thing. But anyways, Damien, I'm going to give it over to you here for, um, you know, you got like, whatever, 45 minutes, whatever you need there to, uh, to get your, your conversion story out there. And then if there's questions, um, we'll get them up there as well. And like I said, if I see something in there as well that I might want to stop you on, I might do that as well. So the floor is all yours, Damien. Right, so thanks very much, Father Luke. How are you Not doing? Bad. Pretty good, actually. Well, yeah, just maybe shared a bit about me, my early childhood. You know, I, I grew up in Dublin. You know, I had a good family, you know, my mother and father, you know, and uh, good family. As I said, I had one older brother and one younger sister, you know. Uh, I was born in 1973. That sounds like a millennium away now, you know. So I'm a 70s baby. Um, probably, you know, just to share about the family and that, uh, when I was younger, you know, my father, he used to breed pigs. He had a lot of pigs. And I remember being five, six years of age, you know, and, you know, daddy would keep the pigs and that. He also was were absent, and then all of a sudden, like you're like, oh yeah, he ended up in heroin. Obviously, it's like because he was coming from a broken environment. So it's like, a, I like the I like the angle, you know. So like, even if you're coming from, you know, it would be a nice environment. I myself came from basically, you know, the same thing, and it's uh, it doesn't matter at the end of the day. Like obviously, it's you know, you get into the wrong crowds, and then you can take it off. But uh, how old were you when you um, like you said you were in dif you know in and out basically of of, of prison like the heroin thing i thought actually once someone got into heroin um i never did heroin like i saw that 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 um like crack and heroin were basically the gateways where there was no escape like you basically got into that and there was no getting out we just we had circles of buddies that were getting into it and i just for me i thought you know if i get in there i'm not getting out so i actually didn't know it was you know that you could get out of heroin that you can get in and get out yeah, just just for me, father, you know, just just I don't know, it was just a lifestyle. Everyone I knew was on it, you know, and uh, you know, just just this is it, you know, this is a path I have chosen, you know. So, father, that was going on, and it's good getting into different situations and always in trouble and that, you know. And my dad was always praying for me. Every priest he met, you know, he saying, "Father, you know, celebrate a mass for them." You know, he's in prison, he's, he's on drugs and stuff. And one day he approached me, and as I said, me and my dad, we are pretty close, you know, when I was younger. And we were always together, you know, and, and with the horses and stuff, and 
spoken together and things like that. And we hadn't seen him for, for you know a few months here and there. I'd see him in a few months and that, that you know. I mean, I always speak about meeting up, going for a cup of tea or something, but you know, I'd never turn up. I'd always let him down. I was dishonest. I was unreliable. You know, my whole life was upside down. And one day he, he was praying for me, and uh, someone gave him a video of uh, two group, two girls, uh, two American girls, and the video was all about Medjugorje. And the two girls said on the video they had been drug addicts, and uh, you know they had been to Medjugorje, and he had changed their life, you know. So my dad was saying, you know, I have to get Damien to, to Medjugorje. So he approached me one day, and he says, Damien, will you come to Medjugorje? Now, I knew it was something to do with religion and stuff, and I says, no way, you're not going anywhere, you know, we're in for a week, you'd be just nuts and praying and stuff, and, you know, I was happy, just leave me alone, leave, leave me, take me drugs, and I was kind of comfortable in that sense. And uh, he showed me this travel brochure of all the Croatian beaches and stuff, he said, oh, Medjugorje is close by that, so he kind of tricked me into going, you know. So we booked a ticket for me to Medjugorje, it was 1996, it was August, and... Uh, you know, it was August 1996, and uh, I, I, I was even before we were on the plane. You know, it was it was taking drugs, heroin before we were on the plane, and uh, so we got on the plane, Father, and I kind of felt guilty because I had let him down so many times that I owed it to him to go to Medjugorje. You know, to just go and I said the week is not going to kill me, but I knew I had no drugs, you no know, back up over there. So Father, we got over on the plane, and I was down my head on the plane. Um, we had to drive three hours from Dubrovnik down to, uh, to, to, to Medjugorje. And I just remember waking up on the plane on this journey. And there was all these people praying the rosary and stuff and chanting, yeah, they, oh my God, what am I have to get myself into for the week? You know, just a load of grannies here, you know. We arrived in Medjugorje and the drugs was wearing off me. And, uh, you know, we went to the hotel and I put my bags in. And I think for an hour, I just went up the main street and just looked around the shops and that. And I come back to my dad and I said, listen, you know, give me my passport. I want to get out of here. This is nuts, this place, you know. I, I hate the place, you know. So we said, oh, no, son, give it a chance, you know. Give this place a chance. So we went to the hotel and, you know, for two days, I was just looking around and it was real negative and stuff and full of anger I was, you know. And every night I couldn't sleep because of no drugs. I used to walk up and down the main street of Medjugorje on my own to be, to be known around and with a lot of dark thoughts in my head and stuff like that, you know. I was doing that for two nights and on, on the, the second day we there that night, the third morning, I hadn't slept in three days with the effects of the drugs. And uh, there was a little bench beside a lady in, in the Grotto of St. James, it's a statue of a lady of Medjugorje. You know, I slept down there at about four o'clock in, in the night and I woke up about five o'clock or half five or something, you know. And we got about an hour and a half sleep or something. But I remember waking up and it was a very profound moment. And, this, you know, the sun was shining on my face. There was little birds chirping. And there was this lovely breeze, you know, blowing over my head as I awoke, you know. And, Father, I, I felt peace. You know, I hadn't felt since I was a child, you know, this, this interior peace. Now, it was nothing like St. Paul, nothing like that. But just saying, you know, this, this, is, this is some kind of peace that I, that I hadn't experienced, you know. So I went back to the hotel to, to, to my dad and he could see something in my eyes, you know, he could see a little change there or maybe I looked a bit clearer, I don't know. And he says, you okay, son? I says, yeah, I'm okay. And he says, yeah, you know, when you come to mass, when you get breakfast, come to mass, he says, right, come on, I'll go to so. Because I hadn't been practicing for maybe, we don't know, six, seven years, you know, since I was 15, maybe I stopped practicing. I was, I was 23 at this time. And, uh, during the Mass, we, we went to Holy Mass in, in St. James's in Medjugorje. And, you know, there was this Irish guy behind me. And when you turn around to shake hands for, for the embrace, you know, I shook his hand and he turned around to me and we shook and that was it. So when Holy Mass was over, and this guy was standing at the back door of the church and he, he introduced himself. He says, how you doing? He says, uh, you know, my name is Bill and I'm from, 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 uh, from Wexford. And, uh, you know, have you been here for long, you know? So, I, so I, mean, I wasn't even speaking. My father, you know, spoke for me. He said, yeah, yeah, we came in, you know, two days ago. And uh, he said to me, have you been to the Blue Cross? Have you been to Crucifix Mountain? And I just said, no, we've been, been nowhere, you know? I was, you know, in the hotel and stuff. So my father kind of, you know, said, take him under your wing, you know, take take Damien off, 
you know, try and sort them out. So this guy, Bill, you now uh, we start walking and, you know, he was a tough, tough guy. Bill was, Bill was from the traveling community. And, you know, he just started telling me a little bit of his story. He had been a week there before. This was his second week. And he was on fire, this guy, you know, he was a, he was a tough guy. And he started saying, let's pray a rosary, you know. And he brought me up to the Blue Cross. And, you know, he started telling me how much a lady had a plan for me and how much a lady loved me. You know, he, you know, brought me around. And this guy, you know, he wasn't afraid to, 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 to his faith. I'd never met any young person in my life that was just, you know, they loved their Catholic faith. They weren't embarrassed of it. They were encouraging, you know. So we stayed with Bill for that week. You know, he helped me do detox. I was very sick. I was. I was young, cold talk. And, you know, Bill kept encouraging me. And, you know, the expression, take me under your wing. I do believe that he was a guardian angel for me. You know, that he, he, he really, really helped me. That week was over, you know, and I met some good people and I couldn't, you know, set, never seen all these young people, you know, all these young kids from all different countries and they're all so happy. And I said, one of these guys, they're just, you know, they're so peaceful and polite to me and stuff. It was, uh, I started hanging out with a group. By the end of the week, I got to know different young people from Ireland, from, you know, U2000 and all these prayer groups. And, you know, I got to start chatting with a few young seminarians. And, uh, you know, they were encouraging me in the faith and stuff. So we heard at the end of the week, there was a few young people who were staying over. The pilgrim group we went with was, was, was give them, you know, some money and paying for the accommodation, you know. So my father got wind of it. And, uh, you know, he approached me and said, listen, you know, Damien could really benefit from a second week. But just saying, oh, no, sorry, Jim. You know, there's no room. All, all the spaces have been taken. So this, on the last day, the seminary and going, oh, this guy, he approached me and he said, Damon, you know, he said, I want to give you my second week for free, you know, I want to give you a few bob. You know, you need it more than I do. So I said, are you sure? He says, yeah, you, you, you need it. So uh, it turned out to be that I got to stay, but he also got to stay as well, you know, they, they made room for him. So we had a second week there in Medjugorje and, you know, it was an amazing week, you know, and I feel, you know, the QPA yeah, there and, and stuff. And something changed to me, Father, that first week in Medjugorje. And, you know, I call it, illumination of conscience, you know, where I knew right from wrong. I left Medjugorje knowing right from wrong, you know, something, something touched me out there and, you know, had amazing two weeks out there, met great, great people. I came home after the two weeks, Father, uh, back to Dublin and, you know, I, I struggled with the addiction. I got going back with my girlfriend and, you know, she was a heroin addict as well and my pals, I was hanging out with heroin addicts and I just fell back into the drug scene, you know, and, uh, but something did change in me, you know, I never stole after Medjugorje you know, I was trying to be, behave, behave myself as, as best I could, you know. Um, during that time, I went to my doctor and uh, I said, listen, I've been on heroin for a few years. I want to come off it. So he was saying that maybe I could try uh, Fiseptone. So I went on Fiseptone for two years. And then after that, they changed Fiseptone to Methadone. So I was on Fiseptone Methadone for five years, you know. And during that time, you know, I, I jobs here and there. I was doing driving and stuff. And you know, I was working in building sites and, you know, doing deliveries and stuff. And, uh, but I was very unhappy, Father, you know, just with the methadone, it's, it's, it's a kind of liquid and it's a cough ball. You know, you drink it every morning and you're kind of comatose, you're sedated and stuff. And, you know, my life was getting more miserable, you know, more miserable. And I, I, I couldn't, couldn't make sense out of it. That would have brought me up to 2002. And, you know, I was just very depressed, Father. And I go to my doctor and I say, doctor, you know, I'm suicidal, you know, I'm really depressed. And he'd say, oh, here's a pill, here's a tablet for you. You know, I'd say, doctor, I can't sleep at night, you know, you have anxiety. He'd say, oh, here's a pill for you. You know, and, you know, he had me on Valium and uh, antidepressants and was taking methadone and stuff. And, you know, I was on a con concoction of pills and stuff. And, you know, I was really just, oh, what is this, you know? And, you know, summer of 2002, I was, I was driving a lorry. And I was doing deliveries, I was trying to keep the job down, and I just couldn't, you know, ride on top of me. And I kind of had a bit of a breakdown. And, you know, I heard someone calling this breakdown. Maybe it was a breakthrough, you know, I heard that kind of before. But I was hearing this voice, you know, it was very suicidal, Father. And maybe elocution, I was hearing more than a voice. And I was just saying, Damien, you know, you're a waster. You know, you wasted your life. And, you know, uh, just to backtrack, uh, four years pre previous to that, uh, myself and my girlfriend, we had a little girl we had, you know, and, uh, you know, this 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 voice, or 
who's saying, you know, look at your child, you're a drug addict, you know, your, your, your family, look what you've done. You'd be better off without them, you know, just kill yourself, you know. And I was com contemplating that, you know, for a few months and, you know, just, I was in so much emotional pain that, you know, I can't put it into the English language. I can't describe what this is like. It was like someone put my hands on my head and, and, and just pushed me into a black pit, you know, there was, there was no answer for it, you know. And uh, with that, a family member, my sister, brought me back. Within three days of that breakdown, you know, she brought me back to Medjugorje. And, uh, you know, I was out there for a few days, recuperated, you know. But just to backtrack, I would have, for my first time in Medjugorje in 1996, I would have went out there every year, you know, with my girlfriend and with my child, you know. And it was like recharging the batteries from me, you know, when it's so low. I go back to Medjugorje, and I just I just recharge the batteries from you know. Would you go back? This is a question, actually. I'm glad you 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 mentioned that. Um, you would go back and recharge your batteries, but then when you would return back to Ireland, would you fall back into the basically same stuff, or did you have? I would, I would, father, because when I when I go to Medjugorje for them five years, I was always on methadone, you know. So I would go back as a drug addict, yeah, you know. Okay. And uh, people, you know, uh, methadone, you know, it's like a cough while yeah. you drink it. So this last time in, in, in 2002, I was in Medjugorje, and uh, I went to the Chinaclo house. Now, I was familiar with the Chinaclo community over the years. I had, you know, heard guys giving testimony, but I had a big fear to change my life. I had a big fear, you know, they speak a different language. It's Italian, you know, and then I said, gee, Mike, what, what, what are you doing in Medjugorje? So I went up to the house, I think, after three, four days after, you know, getting a bit of strength back. And I was speaking to one of the Chinaclo lads, you know, and he said to me, I'm from Dublin, Ireland, I've been on drugs for 14 years, you know, and, you know, I've been to Medjugorje and I can't, I'm fairly suicidal. So the guy looked me in the eye and, you know, the words he said just touched me hard. He said, Damon, he says, you want to come back to God? You want to change your life? And I really didn't you know, he really had a, a big impact on me. After that sentence, he began to tell me, he said, you know, we have a community in Ireland. And I said, no. He said, we only opened a Chinaclo in Knock in County Mayo last year, you know. So I was telling him his story. I said, what do I have to do to get into Chinaclo in Ireland? So he says, do you have to go to Dublin to these meetings every week? And the guys back there, you know, they, 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 they'll help you through, you know. So, Father, I come back to Dublin in uh, 2002, and I rang the Chinaclo community in Ireland, and uh, they arranged me to go to this weekly meeting, you know. So I went to the weekly meeting, the first meeting. And the lads told me, you know, I had to come off all my drugs, that they don't give out drugs. Uh, I'd have to come off everything, you know. Uh, maybe just to give you a viewers who, who don't know about Chinaclo, uh, it's community Chinaclo. And it was started by an Italian sister, uh, Mother Elvira, in, in 1983. And she had no qualifications whatsoever, but she was uh, the eldest of seven children. And her father was an alcoholic. So she lived with addiction all her life, you know. She went to religious life and she had a big desire, a big big passion uh, to work with drug addicts, you know, the people who's lost in life, maybe took the wrong path in life, you know, maybe people who were suicidal, people with food disorders, people with depression, alcohol. So it didn't, it wasn't just specifically drugs, you know. Uh, she prayed for many years and then her superiors, you know, gave her the permission to do this, this work, the Chinacla work. And the local council of Italy, of Saluso, North Italy, they donated a broken house, you know. So this house was dilapidated. Uh, the only, there was no roof. The only thing over the door was a statue of a lady, you know. And Mother Alberta knew by that statue that this was God's work, you know. And again, you know, she's a big, big faith. She says, Lord, if this is your work, I'm a little small nun. And she's a big, big heart. She says, Lord, you'll have to, you'll have to, you know, do, do your providence. So she really has a big faith in divine providence. So she opened this house with two of her sisters and, you know, guys started coming, girls, addicts started coming to her and she was learning, she was building, she was putting a roof on and these addicts were learning her. And one of the guys said one day, you know, sister, you're so happy, you know, you know, we can see that you pray, you know, can we pray, you know? And she says, of course you can pray. If you want to pray, we pray. And, you know, she started exposing them to the rosary, to adoration and stuff like that. And that was just how Chinaclo evolved. I think, I think, Four years after that, uh, she used to bring the, the, the lads and girls to, to Medjugorje and she started out in a tent and stuff like that. And, you know, they used to help the locals to build them work and that. And Elvira noticed that 
you know, when they were in Medjugorje, that they, they were a lot calmer and peaceful, the drug addicts. So she opened a house for, for men and women in Medjugorje. Uh, so, yeah, Father, that, that was a Chilakov community. So, as I said, I, I went to these meetings uh, in Dublin and, uh, you know, told a lot of my story. So they said, listen, you know, we have no counselors here, we, we, we no doctors, you know, we just live a simple life. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of, it's, it's very successful, you know. So I went back to my doctor and I told him that there was a possibility of a bed in this treatment center, this community, down in Knock in Mayo. And uh, we started, with my doctor, we started a process of detoxing me off this methadone, which I had been on for five years, you know. I think that was a, that was a horrific part of my life, Father. So a lot of people don't understand. Heroin is, you know, gets into your bones and so does methadone. So when you stop taking the substance, you know, you have pains. It's like someone, you know, sticking a knife in your back and your legs and stuff. And that's why a lot of addicts won't come off it because it's so excruciating. But I think for me, through my father's prayers and that, we had this determination, you know. And I said, two things are going to happen. I'm going to do it or I'm going to come off these drugs. I just had this, this fight in me that I hadn't had in a few years. And I said, this is it. You know, I'm going to come off this methadone. And I did, you know. Uh, it was excruciating, a month of, of, of cold turkey. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't wish it on anyone, you know, it was excruciating and that. But uh, I kept going to these Chilaco meetings every week and the guys there, you know, damn, you're doing well, encourage me and, uh, and stuff like that. So eventually I'd done me four or five weeks there and the guy said to me, uh, you know, we give you a few walking days, you don't just come into Chilaco, we have these walking days, uh, you go to a and b and down in Knock in County Mayo. And Father, funny enough, the name of this B&B was the Divine Mercy B&B, you know, you, you couldn't write this, you know. And they were friends of Chinaclo who, who took the lads in. So, you know, it's Jerry and Elsie Tully down and knock and, you know, I still stay with them, the, 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 the lifelong friends friends now, you know. And so we started with them for eight days. And, you know, I used to go to Chinaclo in the morning time. I do what they call a walking day. Uh, I'd go there at nine and, you know, I'd walk with the lads and, you know, I'd come back to the B&B at five in the evening and get some food there. And it was just a, a day of just gently let me see the Chinaclo lifestyle, you know. Uh, something also about Chinaclo works on three pillars. Uh, one would be the prayer and the friendship and the hard work, you know. The prayer would be very balanced, Father, you know. It's not about, you know, oh, look at this quote out of the Bible. It's about living it, you know. Don't don't preach to me, man. Show me how you lift this prayer, you know. About holding the door for someone, you know. You give a glass of water, you, you save yourself last. And, you know, you're having a bad day, you know. Think of the brothers in the house, you know. Maybe have Dave Moore going on with you. So I was exposed to this new lifestyle because... You know, when you're an addict, father, you know, you're very selfish, you know, for me, we used to lie, steal, cheat, you know, it's very dishonest, you know, very self-centered. So you're into this community that, you know, turns that on his head where instead of taking, you give, you know, you serve and that, you know. Uh, so that would be the prayer, you know, obviously there was Rosie there, there's adoration. And, you know, I came to a Catholic family, but we didn't know, like, dad brought me to Malvinas and stuff when I was a kid. But I remember seeing on the wall, my first day in Chinaclo, you know, adoration, you know, Paddy's doing adoration at 8 o'clock, Johnny's doing at 9 o'clock, and it's, I couldn't even pronounce the words, you know, but all the lads in Chinaclo, you know, they, they just say, went to Jesus, you know, get some peace off Jesus, you know, and tell the Lord if you're struggling with some things, you know. They used to talk, talk about the friendship, the friendship in Chinaclo, you know, when, when we're drug addicts, you know, you know, we, we have drugs, everyone wants to be with us, you know, we want to be with someone if they've summed off on me, but in Chinaclo, we, we, we can't offer each other anything because we have nothing, you know, we live our providence, you know, we, we grow our own food, people don't eat clothes, you know, it's a, it's, it's a very simple life. And the true friendship would be, you know, not saying, pat me on the shoulder, say, Damien, you're a great fella. It might be pointing out, you know, something, maybe there's moments when I'm lazy, maybe, you know, there's anger, moments of anger, and give me a few truths, you know, we call that true friendship, you know, where someone might suffer with me, telling me something that, you know, it could be quite uncomfortable for me, you know, something I don't want to hear about my pride, my anger, you know, my laziness, whatever it may be, you know. And that's true friendship. The other one, Father, would be work, you know, it was a big, big work ethic, you know. We go up six in the morning, we're praying, we're walking all day, you know, we're chopping trees down, you know, walking in the gardens, planting food. You know, we have animals there, we're looking after them. And, uh, you know, we, we, we have kitchen fare, we learn how to cook. You know, we do maintenance work, we do you know, build houses, or we're doing building work and stuff. So it's very demanding, but it's just, it's, it's great to be just tired at the end of the day, a natural toredness, you know, it's, it's, it's an amazing organization, you know. 
So yeah, father, I, 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 I do my work and as I entered. Uh, I was in Ireland for the year I was, you know. I think for the first month, you know, I didn't speak. You know, I was just so broken, father. You know, I couldn't put one word together, you know. But the lads were very patient with me. They kept encouraging me, you know, to, to keep the prayers going. And, you know, they, 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 they really took their patience with me. I remember kind of, you know, they prayed a rosary every day and they, they shout were out. And it was my kind of tone. Some of the lads were saying, man, pray a decade there, Damien. And I remember saying the first decade, and it was probably 15 years, you know, since I heard the real me, you know, my voice and stuff. And, you know, it was a very daunting moment, you know. But they just keep encouraging uh, in, in, in the blood, you know. Uh, after a year in Ireland, I got transferred to the big house in Medjugorje. You know, that was a wonderful experience, you know, going back to Medjugorje, uh, being in Chilakula up there. When I was there, there was 127 lads, you know, in the community from every corner of the planet. You know, could be having lunch with guys from Mexico, South America, you know, American guys, Canadian guys, South Africa, you know, Africa, Irish, European, and it was an amazing experience. In that year, 2003, uh, John Paul II was after bringing out the Mysteries of Life. And, you know, uh, the lads do a big play for the youth festival every year. And Mother Elvira decided that we reenact uh, the Mysteries of Light. So I got to do that for three months out there. That was a wonderful experience, you know, to do the reenacting and you make their own clothes and their own music. And we got to perform at the youth festival, I think, in front of thousands of young people. But leaving that aside, it was great for me to see the fate, you know, to see the actual mysteries being acted out and that, you know, it was a great experience, you know. It's um, it's quite a different uh, look from from a rave with the strobe lights and thousand thousand young people to to dancing the mysteries of light in front of thousand young people. I guess that's just like the irony of of where God takes you. But um, so how long were you actually in the Chinacolo community? How long did you do the the experience? Yeah, I was in there for it was for fifteen months altogether. You know, uh, when I exit Chinacolo, I come back to Dublin. Then I did, you know. And uh, we had my girlfriend was there and Mary was there. And I think, Father, the first thing I wanted to do was get good with God, you know. And uh, I said to Mary, you know, we, we have to get married. And she, she agreed, you know, she said she'd marry me, you know. And, uh, you know, I started my own business uh, when I left Chinaclo. I started a waste disposal company, you know. And, uh, you know, I went to the local council and we had to do a few things and stuff. But Chinaclo kind of fires you up, you know. In Chinaclo, we say nothing is impossible with God, you know. And that's our motto, you know, so nothing is impossible. So it gives you good work ethic and stuff. So I had to deal, you know, I was uneducated and I put, yeah, you know, I approached the local councils and, you know, they gave me a lot of paperwork. But eventually uh, I got a waste, Dublin waste permit and, you know, I could collect as much waste in Dublin as I want. You know, I loved the physical work, you know. I had a truck, I had, I was in the yellow pages, you know, I was advertising everywhere. And, uh, you know, we used to collect, uh, you know, broken, you know, houses, we used to do demolition work, you know, take waste away, we used to clean gardens, we used to cut trees down. So we're still after a good few years, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, Providence, you know, large Providence, and my, my bank account filled up then, you know, and uh, myself uh, and my wife, we had a wonderful wedding, you know. Um, we wanted to go and thank our lady, you know, for, for all she had done for us, you know, for saving us from, from the darkness and stuff. So we went to Medjugorje, we went to Dubrovnik, uh, for three days and we, we had a lovely three days there for the honeymoon and then we went down to Medjugorje for four days then to thank our lady you know so that was a wonderful experience there you know uh, so yeah during that time father I, 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 I picked up the matter spoke but I, I, I don't think we went to that for, 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 for this recording unless you want to you know uh, so yeah another thing when I left Chinaclo was a big help to me uh, I wanted to give back and I joined the Legion of Mary in Dublin. And, you know, they have a hostel there for homeless men. It's called the Morning Star Hostel. Uh, they also have a hostel for women, for young young girls who are drug addicts. The Regina Cheney Hostel, you know. And uh, there's a few connections with the Irish Chinaclo, with some of the re- directors and friends of Chinaclo Ireland. And they, they were also involved in the Legion of Mary. You know, they used to work with the homeless people there. So uh, I joined at the Legion of Mary. And that was a great formation for me. In the early days, it was with a great bunch of men, you know, and they were businessmen, they were solicitors, they were lawyers, they were builders and ex-prisoners. And we used to come together at these meetings. We used to, you know, you know, work in a homeless shelter. And it, all this was getting exposed to the Catholic faith. And, you know, we, 
to teach in the trade, and that was great to be part of that. And you know, I met some great people who was big examples to me. You know. So you've been, um, if I'm getting this right, was it what like around 2003 or four when you had your like? What year did you leave Tanakalo? Uh, I left. I went to the Sri in 2000, uh, early 2002, and I left the late 2003. Okay. And so from there, you've been. You, you do you still have the same, let's say, uh, spirit and peace that you received after your like hell of cold turkey and going through like you know the. The hard work and the prayer at Chinaclo, do you still have the would you say you still have that piece which you received in Chinaclo today? Yeah, father, yeah, it goes, you know, life is tough. Uh, you know, just to, 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 to move on a bit and just share about that as well. Just uh so 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 me and the the, 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 the girlfriend got married in two thousand and five. Uh, since then we've a very big family with twelve children. We have 11 of our own, and we've won foster child. We have 11 years, you know, so uh, it can be tough, you know. It's tough, you know. God's providence in my life is unreal, you know. God God gives me everything, you know. He's so good as a father to me, you know. But there is tough moments, but I just go back to what Chanakla learned me. You know, persevere, keep going, keep the prayer going, you know. Find you, you know, help people on your journey. And again, you know, Father, I'm no angel, you know. You ask my spiritual director of a great a good spiritual director, Father David Jones. He's a hermit. He lives in County Maid. You know, he speaks eight languages. He's a very learned man, you know, and I've been going to him for 12 years now. And, you know, I shared everything with this guy, you know. I, I, I share more than, with him than uh, I've shared with any human being and, you know, going through stuff and, and, and like that. And, you know, just offload him and I give him everything. And I just to be floating, Father, when I leave him. It's just, you know... It's just amazing. I can't explain it. The sacrament of confession, you know, and that's something else. Father, about sacraments, you know, and uh, myself uh, and the wife, you know, we lived in sin for for many years, you know, mortal sin, and you know, when we did get the sacrament of marriage, you know, something changed in me, and something changed in her. You know, we looked at each other in a different light, you know, uh, and I just want to just take this opportunity to say, Mary, I love you. She's so good, you know. She's up all night changing nappies and and cooking and, and cleaning and stuff. And she's, she, she, she's a bigger testimony than I have, Father. You know, she she was heroin for years. And, you know, she came from a place in Dublin, notorious for heroin abuse. And, you know, she's a holy woman, you know, and, and, and stuff. So I just want to take this shout, Mary, that, that just thank you for, for, for all you do and for everything, you know. But, uh, Praise yeah. God. This is, um for me, Damon, I keep mentioning it, I think more recently than, than before, but, like the idea of these little like, you know, fireside with fathers or podcasts and stuff that we're we're trying to get out. Uh, it's a dark world out there, and um, I think, you know, the whole uh, idea of trying to give people hope is it really is. I think it's our mission now in this society that we're living in, uh, because it's especially in the context of Ireland where a lot of people would have probably just been there, done that, they've heard it, you know, they they know the crack, they know what the faith is about. But uh, when you see something as broken as your story, because um, like I mentioned before, you said you got out of heroin, you even got off the methadone. Uh, you're like, I, I think I can count on one hand the amount of, you know, guys that I've actually spoken to that have gone through that. Like I said before, it's like, you know, it's usually once heroin gets a hold of you. It's not like you're just taking heroin. It like it gets a hold of you. It's it's very hard to not say impossible to get out of that unless there's some kind of divine intervention. So your story is brokenness um you know basically one of those lives that should have just ended up in the gutter your wife as well probably with you from that to you know a transformation get your business going uh 12 children you know uh like it's, it's almost just like an explosion of life and and structure from this you know this darkness and brokenness and what did you do you you surrendered like you um you didn't do anything you know, you didn't follow like these steps or this program or, you know, some kind of like self-help thing. You surrendered and God, you know, it's funny because you have the, the divine mercy behind you, but like it was God's, I mean, the prodigal son, but him almost just waiting for that. Like he needs some kind of excuse to come like bursting into your life, you know, running out to grab you and basically give you a piece which, like you said, with the pain, you know, it's like a piece that you can't describe in the English language. You know, you said you were in, under this darkness and suppression that you just you couldn't put into words. 
I personally have felt that with the peace that you receive when you let God into your life. It's like a peace that you can't put into words, and um, you yourself would know, like, from the darkness to the light, there's just nothing to compare it to. Yeah, I think, Father, you know, you know, sin makes you sick, and that was, you know, it was, it was a big sinner, you know, we, we didn't care about anyone else, we just the four army actions, and inside I was sick, you know, was really and truly, physically, mentally, emotionally sick, you know, and the sacraments, oof, you know, just the, the adoration, the healing I got in Chinacla with the adoration, you know, and, you know, the lads would be playing the music then, you know, quiet time, the sharing, you know, the rosary, and, and I love the rosary, you know, just to say, but I'm off drugs 19 years, you know, every, I'm off heroin and all drugs 19 years, and I think there's only one day in, in that 19 years that I haven't played the rosary, you know, I love the rosary, and you know, when I'm nervous, I go into a meeting or something, and we pray the rosary in the car and stuff, and we just get this peace, you know. So it, it, it's really, you know, it's, it's amazing, you know. But uh, so yeah, Father, just to bring you on a bit, we, we had a big gift there, you know, three years ago. Uh, we had a world meeting of families, you know. Uh, the priest friend of mine uh, who lived down in Knock, Father Nigel, he approached me and he said, you know, that there were a few testimonies down in Knock. Uh, in St. John's Resting Care Center, there's a few families there. Who well, was you, you mind Mary? You and Mary mind coming down and sh sh sharing your story? So I said, Yeah, Father, no problem, you know. So we went down and, uh, and myself and Mary were interviewed and we shared some of our stories with, with other wonderful families, you know, beautiful families and, you know, the lovely, lovely kids and that. So the manager of the board meeting of families, Father Timothy Barlett, he was there and he said, Gee, Mike, that's an amazing story. He says, You know, we might do something again. So I was thinking, yeah, maybe the RDS, you know, we, we, we give a little testimony of this, his father, whatever, you know. So we done a little video shoot then a few weeks after, you know, uh, camera crew come out to the house and they wanted to do a little video for the board meeting of families and we, the camera crew come in at six and the kids got out of bed and they're brushing their teeth and we had some crack down that, you know. And that was it then. I said, you know, it was wonderful to participate in it. And about two months before the actual event, Father Tim ran me up again. He said, how you doing, Damien? I said, how are you, Father? He said, uh, are you going to go to, 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 to the board meeting? I said, oh, yeah. I said, well, book them for the RDS, and, you know, we're going to be helping there with the Chilacra community and things like that. And uh, he said, I wonder what you're doing your favor. You know, I said, yeah, Father, anything, you know, you can help out, you know, with your wedding. He said, I want you to meet the Holy Father. I said, what? I nearly fainted, you know, on the spot, you know. And uh, he said, no, take your time, you know, take a week and come back to us and, you know, let us know. So I hung up, I rang into the Mary, and I shook Mary. I said, you want us to meet the Holy Father? And I ring him back in about two seconds. Father, yeah, 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 we, we'll do that, you know. So uh, we, we, you know, it was amazing. And, and, and so, we, so we got there to do practice, you know, in, in the stadium, the football stadium, uh, three days before that, you know, when the manager was there and he was saying, uh, he was sitting in the seat, he was pretending to be the Holy Father. And there was the, the other four families, you know. So he walks us out onto the, the, the football stadium and, uh, you know, there was loads of seats there. The whole pitch was full of seats. So my wife Mary was meant to say an introduction and I was meant to say the, 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 the final words. And uh, she, she, she was overwhelmed, so was I. So she said to the manager, you know, many people will be here watching when we're talking, giving their testimony. So the manager said, oh, there'll be 83,000 people live in the studio, in the stadium and there'll be 3 million watching live on telly, you know. So we nearly fainted and she fainted. So she said, I'm not saying anything, you know. <laughs> well, you know, it's just crazy. I think on the day, you know, there was all these celebrities there. And, you know, it was just, it was just, it was just so surreal. And in the moment the Holy Father drove in, the place went crazy. The noise of it was just nuts. The whole stadium just went to the Lord, the Holy Father come in, you know. And so, yeah, we was four family chosen. One family was ourselves from Europe, the continent of Europe. Another family was from Africa. Another family from Canada, another family from India, and another family from Mosul in Iraq, you know. And, uh, you know, it was an amazing moment. Uh, we got to share that. They've done a pre recorded video, a little testimony. And um, we got to go up to, 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 to greet the Holy Father. And they gave the whole, uh, I think we had 10 then. I don't think we got 10 or 11. <laughs> we had 10 back then, 10 kids. Uh, and uh, we gave us all rosy bits. And that was a beautiful moment. Uh, during the we got to sit with the Holy Father for two hours, you know, it was, it was amazing. Um, one final thing about that father, 
uh, when, when the Holy Father was giving his homily, you know, his catechism to the world, you know, and he thanked all the families individual uh, for the witness. Uh, me and Mary's story was witness to hope. And, you know, we, you know, hopefully we, we get people hope that nothing is impossible with God, you know. And uh, he looked me in the eye, Father, you know, and he says, you know, do the kids frustrate you? Do they, do they make you angry? And the Italian interpreter was sitting right beside me. And he said it, you know, Damon, he says, the Holy Father's asking you, you know, do the kids upset you? Do they make you frustrate you and stuff? And I just told me head in that second, you know, how do we answer this? You know, everyone's looking at me. How do we answer? I looked at the interpreter and I said, yeah, you know, has someone told him my confession, you know? And uh, it was a beautiful moment, you know? I, I, I think, yeah. Uh, one of the main things stuck with me was being with Father Harry Ghani's family. And I'll, I'll touch on that next week. You know, he was martyred. And we spent a weekend with them, you know. And, you know, this guy was a priest. He, he spent some time in Ireland. And he was murdered for the Catholic faith. So that was a big thing, you know, to, to realise this. We, we spent a weekend with his mother and father, you know, his niece and nephew and, and his sister. But uh, maybe I'll speak more about that next time. Yeah, because we're know? definitely going to get you on for the next one because you've got... Um... You did a re uh, the Our Martyrs, which is a book I think every I Irish household has in it, and um, you actually have a funny story of how you found your first copy of it. But um, that I think we could save for another episode because you've you've done a shorter, you know, abbreviated, easier or more manageable edition of that, and you actually have a, a very good point of view on the situation right now in Ireland and the similarities which we're living. Um, you know, when the penal laws were going on and the our, our martyrs, the Irish martyrs, what they lived, like the similarities are uncanny, what we're living now and what they were living then. I think we could save that for another one. Um, the Chinacola thing is, is, is uh, we're actually in the process of working on a, a mini documentary kind of um, episode on the community because we feel like that has to get out, especially now. And um, it was very close to being closed down, the one in Knock. And providentially, it's been, you know, there's been an injection there, thanks be to God. And it is the answer to lads with addictions and lads with um, mental health issues. Basically, lads that want to have an encounter with God through these three pillars, the prayer, friendship, and um, hard work. But um, there's a question here. So that's for the moms as well. If, you know, moms that have their kids, dads who have kids, um, friends who have a friend, you know, anybody, Chinacolo is... It is the answer for that. So really check it out if you don't know what it is. But um, Eugene Keeley, you know him. Um, he actually has a question here. He says, uh, what recommendations would you give a young person um, who is going to Chinacola with no addictions? Yeah, it's tough. You know, just, you know, uh, I know Eugene, sometimes we take people in for an experience. But uh you know, Eugene will be treated just like the guys, the drug addicts, you know. We'll have a guardian angel, he'll grow up at the same time, he'll, he'll do the same work, you know. But uh, you really, really be benefit from it. And I trust Chinaclo so much that, please God, my kids, my children, when they get older, that they will go in for an experience because we, we don't call it a rehab or a treatment centre. You know, we call it a school of life, you know. So you learn school, skills, you know, about yourself, about other people and stuff. And, you know, and enjoy it. You know, it is good times. You know, it's it's all about beating yourself, flagellating yourself. There, 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 there's good times, good crack football and and a deep prayer life. You know, and uh, they really touch on a lot of addictions there. You know, we all we mightn't be heroin and addicts, but we all have some sort of addictions. And maybe, you know, Eugene, uh, you might recognise that. But enjoy it. You know, and you, you'd be grand. You know. What I've um what I've heard as well, this is from another buddy of mine who did Chinacolo, um, Colin Whitla. So if he's listening, we'd give a shout out to Colin. Um, but he said that there's also a thing I think that Mother Alvira wanted in the community. Um, she wanted religious and seminarians to visit and you know kind of like see the whole thing. And he said that when sometimes you get a seminarian in there who was um you know he was feeling good about himself. He's like you know I. I never really got into that hard stuff. These poor guys, you know, they've been suffering. They've got addiction. So he's coming here to help them out, you know. And Mother Alvira, like in her wisdom, knew that the lads sniff out pride from a mile away. You know, they, they can they recognize it because it's just like there. And so these seminarians would go in there, you know, like ah, giving a good, giving a hand there for these poor, you know, addicts. And the, addict, Adam, what, the what addicts would good? just get, would put them in their place right away, you know. And like the seminarians would leave, you know, humbled, like 
like, that's kind of like the idea you know it's like they would they would see you know like that the, the worst addiction the worst sin in there was their own like self-love and pride so i think that's also like a really you know beautiful thing there about the chinacolo And mothers as well, Father. My mother said it to me today. She says, Damien, don't be so prideful, you know. So we have to look into that as well, it's all of worst. us, you know. It's the worst. It's it's making you um you're you're putting yourself with Satan, you know. That was his sin. So like that's kind of that's kind of scary there. But uh Damien, look, you're in um for me it was uh it was beautiful to see because I have a couple people in mind as I'm hearing you talk and um like I said before, I don't think it gets worse than heroin. Um, as far as the chain goes, you know, one thing leads to another. It can be, you know, you start smoking, drinking, having the crack, you know, raves. Everybody does it. But then, like, once you start putting in these, like, you know, really heavy drugs, it's usually, like, very hard to get out of. So, like, as I was listening to you, I was thinking of some some friends of mine and, um, you know, praying for them. But like you said, there's nothing, nothing more powerful than, than adoration and mass. And our part as well, even interceding for these guys who we know, like, so if anybody's listening, you know, you know, somebody who's really like you described it, like under this just black, dark pressure of any addiction or depression or darkness to um, to go before the blessed sacrament, intercede for them if they themselves can't do it. You know, like we can be those those friends that, you know, like in the gospel, they lower down the other guy at the feet of Jesus, you know, through adoration and mass, get these people at, at his feet, even if they physically can't do it, you know, through our our frequenting of the sacraments. So, but Damien, I'm, I'm hopefully, you know, we'll see more of you. And, um, you know, like I said, there's, there's more to this. There's a lot in there and, um, we praise God for this. Cause I think also Ireland needs to hear this. Ireland needs to hear that this is, you know, this is, a it's a message of hope. It's something that's God's done in your life. Your conversions now, you know, it's not yours. It's something that he's, he's done. He's taken over your life and he's doing great things. So we praise God for that. And, um, we can end with a, a prayer in the blessing, and hopefully uh, we'll be seeing you in the near future. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother Holy Mary. of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you guys, and we'll see you next week. God bless.